Y'all ready for R6? Did y'all get to read the chapter? Yeah. I didn't okay, forget cool. this time. <laughs> okay, cool. Because this one's kind of kind of dense and I omitted some of the explanation uh, and paraphrased uh, in a number of different places. So I just want to make sure that everybody's going to be able to keep up. All right, here we go, R6. Um, so chapter 14, this one's pretty dense, object-oriented programming. Um, it was the R6 package was made by Winston Chang, uh, which is interesting. I didn't realize that R6 is something that R Studio made. I thought it was like part of R foundation's work, but I guess it's not. Uh, so Winston made it and R6 in the wild, about 360 packages that use it at present. And some of the notable packages, these are just some of the packages that I selected out of the top 20 or so uh, that stood out uh, because I've just used them before and have found them useful. And they're in no particular order. So call R allows you to initiate a background process from an R script, uh, which is pretty useful. Like if you are debugging or testing something and you want it to run in the background so you can keep coding and testing your code uh, and at the same time see how if you know what you're running in the background works out or not you can use call r to do that send whatever code you want to run that takes a long time that you don't want to block the console you can shift it over to a background process with call r pretty easily and get it out of the way of the console Process X is kind of a lower level interface to system level processes. So we're like running commands. Um, Plumber, some of y'all might be familiar with, is an API for R. So you can expose R functions that you've written and over either the internet or a local area network. So other people can, you know, access function or the results of a function you've written uh, by connecting to the plumber API. Promises is somewhat similar to call R, but it's more flexible. It allows you to kind of send a process to the background. And instead of interacting with it directly like call R, it creates an object called a promise, which basically just can be passed down certain types of pipes and will fill or complete whenever it does. And the, you know, whatever results come out will be provided at that time. So it allows for asynchronous programming. Uh, WebSockets allow you to interact with streaming data over the internet via R. Uh, Keras, which is a popular um, Python library with a number of machine learning algorithms in there that are only implemented in Python, um, like recurrent neural networks and whatnot, is in Keras. Roxygen 2, anybody here who is writing packages I'm sure is familiar with Roxygen 2. Uh, and Quant Tools for modeling portfolios in quantitative finance. And test that, unit testing, probably also folks familiar here with that. So R6 objects have two special properties. Uh, they are an object-oriented programming. They fit an object-oriented programming paradigm and the methods belong to objects rather than generics. And you can call them with the dollar sign, as you see there, object method. R6 objects are mutable, which means they're modified in place and not copy on modify. 
and so they have reference semantics. The R6 object is basically a set of functions with its own internal environment that is modified by those functions. So it's an outline. R6, R6 class is the one function to create R6 classes. We'll learn about that in 14.2 and point three. We'll learn about access mechanisms in R6, private and active fields. In point four, we'll explore the consequences of reference semantics and some common gotchas. And then in point five, uh, I didn't include that, but you can read that in the chapter of why he why Hadley covers R6 rather than the base RC system. And if you didn't read it, it's mostly because R6 is less complicated and has slightly better performance than the RC system. And RC requires uh, you to understand S4, so. Um, I had falsely mentioned uh, that R Selenium used R6, or at least I thought it used R6 but it actually doesn't. I don't know if it uses RC or something because the syntax certainly looks like R6, but I checked it, it doesn't use R6. It might use RC. Um, so classes and methods. A class name argument has an upper camel case convention. The public argument supplies a list of methods, which are functions and fields, which are anything you want that makes up the public interface of the object. So these objects can be interacted with or called by the user. And so looking at the internals of a R6 object, we have call R, R process. So this is uh, the kind of R6 background process unit. And it inherits from process X has an initialize, it has a get result that returns the result of whatever is running in the background, it has a finalize that closes the process, clone, and then some private options that are created upon initializing the process, but then you can't interact with them after that. Um, yeah, so, oh, whoops, that's an important thing. So you always want to assign the result of an R6 class into a variable with the same name as the class. Um, just to keep yourself from getting confused as to what it contains and how it will behave. So constructing a new object, there's a method called new. So we can create a new process here uh, and this call our, our process options is just a wrapper for how we pass options to the R process. And function here is the argument of whatever function needs to run in the background. This is what you pass in. So it's, it's easy to pass in a, a Lambda function if you're doing something simple. Otherwise you might need to write a function. So this Lambda function basically counts to 10 and it sleeps for a tenth of a second each time and it multiplies uh each number times its you know predecessor so it'll be it'll initiate with one and so it'll be one times one and then it'll multiply the result of that times one times two y'all know how reduce works so call methods and access fields with the dollar sign so we're gonna walk along this vector and we're gonna sleep for one to two and we're gonna look at whether this process is alive. So we can see that this, we, we can ping this process with this is alive method and it checks to see if that background process is still running at 1.2 seconds and it is. And then it looks again at 2.4 seconds and it's not running anymore. So we can then retrieve the result and we get the result there of all those multiplications. So that's a little bit of how process X works, or not process X, call R works. So method chaining, 
uh, commonly used in languages like Python and JavaScript. Uh, and it's usually a dot that does it in Python and JavaScript. And in here, we can see that we can chain them in a, like each method occupying a new line like this. And it will sequentially perform each uh, method. So this one basically adds a value to the sum with the add method. So we add four, we add four, and then we look at the sum and it ends up being eight. So it makes sense. It's, it's quite close to the way the pipe works. So initialize will override the default behavior of new, which I think just kind of copies the class into an object. And it allows you to add your own input arguments. And you'll also want to add any validation for input arguments, unless that is expensive validation. Like if you have to check multiple things that are kind of deeply nested, then you might want to use a validate uh, separately just for performance reasons. And a print method allows you to override the default printing behavior and it should always return self, the internal environment, invisibly. So methods are bound to individual objects, i.e. they're Previously created objects do not get new methods. So we can see that in action here. So we make an R6 class called person. It's going to have two public, three public methods, name, age, and initialize, and a print method, also public, which prints these. Um, yeah. So that's how you would add those methods, is just add them in there inside of the, this is actually the public argument. Everything that's going into the public argument is this list. So all your methods and all your fields that you want to be public are gonna go in there. So if you make your R6 object and you wanna add some methods after you've created it, you can use the set method. Uh, which is a built-in and it allows you to specify which field, if you want it in public or private, what you want to call it and what the initial, what the value is for it. So we can add those um, methods of accumulator after initializing the object. So inheritance, inherit argument allows you to inherit from an R6 class. So if we want to make a new R6 class called accumulator chatty, you can inherit from the original accumulator and add this new add method that's going to override the previous method. And it's going to add in some, you know, just cat catting, whatever that would be called, printing it to the console of the inputs to the add method. And this super here allows you to call the inherited method. Um, so we can use the add method that was previously defined and call it here after doing the chatty stuff. So when we instant, uh, initialize it, you can see here that it now uses this chatty method to print adding, and then sum tells us that it's 11. And yeah, add overrides the superclass implementation, but we can still delegate to those superclass implementations using super. Analogous to using next method in, in S3. So introspection, some R6 classes have a lot of methods. So this is for 
process X that earlier when we did. You can suspend it, get the working directory, get what the command line is saying, get an error file, write inputs to a file, read all the errors, get the output connection, determine whether it has an error connection, um, supervise it. That allows you to like insert uh, variables into the process if you need to. Uh, you can wait for it, which will block the console while it completes. You can interrupt it and just break it or kill it all together, clone it, initialize. You can get how much memory uh, that prop background process is using. Get username. I'm not really sure what that's about or exa. Um, polling connection, output file, read the error lines, read the output. Uh, yeah, there's that is alive that we used as a finalized method, which we'll learn about shortly. You can resume it if you paused it. And status, CPU time, polling. There's lots of things you can do with that background process. So controlling access, privacy. This is the private fields. Uh, they're set up similarly to public, only they are only available from within the R6 class, not outside of it. So you can interact with it in your public methods, but uh, a user that has initialized an object cannot interact with the private fields. And you can interact with these methods by using private instead of self. So active, uh, fields allow you to access, uh, use accessor functions to define dynamic or active fields. So these would be ones that are changing each time they are called. So here's an example of how private fields cannot be accessed by the internal or from outside the class. So we instantiate this person object with these private fields, age and name. And when we initialize it, we store the values that are passed into initialize to those private fields. Um, so here's the object that we're going to create with a, uh, we're going to instantiate a new object there. And we have, uh, if we call it, we can see the print method prints the age and name. But if we try to call name directly, it just returns null because it's a private field here. Yep. Okay, so active fields. Each active binding is a function that takes a single argument value. So when we initialize this rando R6 class, um, we're going to create a, a random uh, field in private. And when we initialize, we're going to store one to it or whatever. Uh, is passed to that argument. And this active field is going to take a function with that single value argument. If it's missing, it's going to run a pull from a uniform distribution, one number, and store it to the random. And otherwise, if it's if there's some kind of input, it's going to throw an error. So we can see how this works. Instantiate an object. We call it without any um, without any arguments, and it generates a random value. If we try to assign something, it says it's read only. And if we try to pass in an argument, it uh, that's actually the error message from missing when it it runs missing on this integer four, and just gives that error. So uh, I should have ran it one more time, but basically if we called this one more time, it would be a different one. I'm sure you all probably saw that in the chapter. So reference semantics. Objects are not copied when modified. They're modified in place in the environment. If you want to copy, you'll have to clone the R6 object and then 
those objects inside of there will be uh, modified in place and they will be separate from whatever your other R6 object has. Um, clone does not recursively clone nested R6 objects. So if you want that, you'll need to use clone deep equals true. So if you have any like nested um, internal objects, you have to use that deep equals true argument. So this makes it a little bit harder to reason about code because you have to understand the context of the, the class that is being created. Uh, it makes sense to think about an R6. When an R6 object is deleted, you can write a finalize method to complement initialize, which may close a database connection or close like a WebSocket connection or something like that. If one of the fields is an R6 object, you must create it inside initialize, not R6 class. So, so yeah, if you if you're trying to store an R6 object to a field, um, you would need to do that inside of the initialize function that runs when the uh when the object is created and not just kind of in the um, r6 class call proper so this is an example of how the reasoning is can be somewhat confusing so f calls methods of x or y it might modify them as well as z uh, so this is an r6 class that we'll call list not not a normal like s3 list uh, and we instantiate it with a equals one and b equals two and so when we call it like this we know that z is probably modified and x and y might also be modified uh, which is how it's different from uh, s3 so to kind of eliminate some of that confusion you can write functions that either return a value or modify their inputs, but not both. Um, just such that other people who use your uh, objects are not confused as to like, have to keep track of what all is happening inside their object when they're calling particular methods. So finalizer uh, is kind of like on exit. It will run something when an object is removed from the environment. So this just creates a temporary file and then unlinks it when the object is removed. Um, this is uh, especially useful if you have like a secure database connection. Uh, you would be able to close that database connection such that it's no longer active and not vulnerable to interception or something when you get rid of that object. Um, it will be shared across when you, sorry, if you use an R6 class as the default value, it will be shared across all instances of the object. So if we take this, this code, we want to create a temporary database every time we call temporary database new, but the current code always uses the same path. So here we pass in this, file temporary file new and the initialize is creates this connection to the database based on the file path and finalize closes the connection and we can see here that if we instantiate dba a and dba b this temporary file new just run ran once instead of each time and so these two are equal even though it's been reassigned or it's been assigned in two different locations so to fix this problem we need to make sure it's called every time that temporary database new is called i.e we need to put it inside of initialize so if we run that temporary file new r6 class inside of initialize then problem solved, it's gonna generate a new file each time. 
the each time the object is run. Um, I'm slightly confused by this. I can't remember if I copied this directly. I think I did, but he calls file here directly instead of self file path, even though he's calling this. Oh, okay, I got it. So file is created here as a public field, and then he's storing that to file. And so I guess it's accessible without using self. Interesting. Okay. All right. So that's our six classes. Anybody have any questions about it? I feel like the stuff was, again, pretty basic um, and didn't really go into like any kind of like practical usage of <laughs> our six classes. I kind of have a question about if you're using an R6 class from a package, when, like, if you just call like person dollar sign new, I guess, I don't know how to phrase it. Is it on the live, like loading the package that those R6 classes are created or is it when you call like process dollar sign new? Does that make sense? It's, it will be when you call process dollar sign new. Okay. So that, that will like instantiate it and initialize it. And like every method will be inherited in your object that you create. Um, yeah, definitely. It's kind of confusing uh, yeah. when you first start to use it for sure. Um, this was my attempt to do it. So I had written this like thing for handling web sockets, uh, which are basically, it's a package that uses R6 and it connects to a streaming like internet address that just pushes information over the internet. And it will listen and receive whatever updates are there. And I had originally tried to solve this without having any knowledge of R6. And so I basically made these objects that were lists with an environment and <laughs> like an R6 class in there. And I was saving to the environment because I didn't know better. <laughs> and so now I'm trying to rewrite it using R6 because that would just make more sense because it naturally has an internal environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically WebSockets has three methods in there. Um, so like it has this WebSocket and we can look at all the names of it. Actually, if we just print it to the console, it'll probably show up. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so it has these different things where it initializes, uh, you can connect to a specific like stream. Usually a WebSocket is like, there's an internet address and then you connect to that when you instantiate the WebSocket and it's just silent at first. And then you connect to certain like streams and when you connect to one of those, it's going to continually send you data, like every, whatever the interval is, like five seconds or a minute or so. And so it allows you to use these methods called on open, on close, on error, on message, uh, send and close. So you can send, this is often useful for like, sending an authentication if it's like a secure web socket and the information is behind some kind of um, authentication ID, 
You can send your authentication headers with that. Uh, close is pretty self-explanatory. You can close the connection. Um, and then ready state allows you to ask the WebSocket what, what state it's in. Like, is it in a state of sending? Is it in like an error state or um, is it a waiting? Is it like a waiting state waiting for a input? And then on open allows you to perform some kind of function uh, based on uh, what it sends back when you initiate the object. So like you were saying, when you actually instantiate the object, um, with WebSockets, it actually doesn't immediately uh, connect, but it allows you to keep the URL and the headers ready. It's only when you call connect that it actually like forms that connection with the server. Um, and then on open is something that's run when that connection is formed, it'll take whatever the response is from the server and do something with it. So you can say like, um, you can check to see if like, was your authentication accurate, like whatever it sends back, whatever event it sends back, it might say like it was an error or it might say ready or beginning or something. And so you can print that to the console or whatnot. You can also have a message on close, um, what happens when there's an error and what happens when there's a message. And that's probably the most important because each, each thing it sends across is a message. So like, for this, this is um, stalker tick data that comes every, you know, second to five seconds to a minute. Um, each message is like a JSON message with the ticker and the uh, values associated with that time point. And so each one would just print to the console if we were using WebSockets as is. But in this case, I want to save those to a data frame and have that as a public method that can be called so you can get all the previous data that has come through over the WebSocket. And I also want to be able to log it like to a file. Um, so you can write these methods or custom methods and assign them, override the, uh, the super class, the WebSocket, you can override these on message and on error with your own custom functions. So that's just kind of a, a use case for how, how uh, R6 is useful. So when, when something is changing via input that you are not doing. So like if it's coming from other users, like in a plumber API, or if it's coming over an automated WebSocket connection, uh, whatnot, that's a good place to think about using R6 because of the um, modify in place. It also allows you to like put some of the back end stuff uh, that, you know, I can't see what it is, but if you go and look at like WebSockets, let me see. If you look at the actual code within WebSocket, there's a lot in there. Well, yeah, it doesn't show you. But if you look at WebSockets, there's a lot going on in the private fields that are like communicating using internal protocols. Um, and it allows you to do a lot of stuff for your users in the private fields and then make a kind of R user friendly um, interface with the public fields. So yeah, um, call R uh, is kind of interesting. Like I recently made up a, a function that if I have some code that's long running, uh, I made a function that will just like, you can encapsulate it with that function and it'll automatically send it to a background job or actually that doesn't use call R, but like if you're working in our studio, 
and you want to send something to a background job, uh, which is useful when it takes a long time to run, uh, you can create a custom function that will send it over to your jobs and you can kind of passively watch what's going on in there while you continue to go about your work in the console. Um, I think jo the jobs things uses call R, but it's not, it's not exposed. It's like built into our studio. Has anybody had any experience using a package that uses R6? I've used Keras, but I guess I didn't realize it was <laughs> R6. Hmm. Um, I used it, yeah, for like a class on deep learning and it has similar, like it has the pipe and you just like stack the different layers of your neural net. Hmm. But I don't remember any R6 stuff. I think it probably uses R6 because the libraries are in Python. So it's like sending stuff over to Python and Python is sending that back whenever it like completes it. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be able to like modify itself internally um, as it gets info back from the Python instance. That's why I think that's probably why it uses R6. But yeah, like it kind of does all that internally and then makes it more user friendly. So you can interact with it in kind of syntax that is more familiar to R. Yeah. I know Roberto has done Roxygen 2, right? Yeah. But, um, I think one of your examples that's the one I have used and I tried to create my own class because cool. for work they had some Python code and it was a class, but then they wanted that into a our package we are creating. So I, I think I said this last week, but I, my first approach was just to create a bunch of generic or just functions that then I will have to call but then in the package, those were internal functions because nothing else will call them other than that particular um, code. And so I had this massive class that the user only calls the one function. So it defines a bunch of things in constants and other stuff. But then the user, he only says like calculate M true and that's it. <laughs> So I feel like it was a lot of stuff just for one single function. <laughs> um, and then I was working with some uh, web services and I wanted to use R6, but then I ended up using S3 because um, I thought it would be easier. <laughs> but then after reading the chapter, I was like, hmm, I should have used R6. So I might go back and I created a small package for that. Um, so I might change it, I don't know, you'll see. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I like it. I feel like it, for me, uh, knowing like some object oriented programming in uh, C++ and Java, it's more like the stuff I was used to. Hmm. Not like S3 where you don't have formal definition, but here you have to like, Called the new, and then a methods belong to the object. So you call your object dollar sign and what you want to do. And so I like that more. But then I like that it falls back to S3. So you could use um, a R6 object with generic methods, because then you can create your own generic for whatever the class is. And I think that she worked. I haven't tested. Well, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. It's, 
Yeah, I mean, it was kind of similar for me. I like, I used WebSockets and it was very, this was a while ago that I wrote this and I kind of made just normal like S3 functions to interact with it. But then it, it does weird things like when you return it from a function, it will like error the class because it's like copying um, it from the internal environment to the external environment. And so the WebSocket would like error if I initialized it inside of the normal function uh, before it got to the outside, which was like this annoying thing because I didn't understand how R6 worked. Um, and so now I'm going back and I'm like, this would make a lot more sense if I just created like an R6 class to encapsulate the WebSocket itself, and it would probably work a lot smoother. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. Hopefully I'll have a better understanding of it. Yeah, I wanna go back to it. Let's see how it goes. But then next week we have S4, so I don't know. If then next week I will say, oh, I like S4 more so we will see <laughs> what's my yeah. opinion after we cover that chapter but i definitely like guess uh r6 i have, i feel very from like familiar with it and i don't know about you but i think the notation is not that complicated because then you have everything in i mean you can start with everything in public and then you have do this do that or set this set that and i to me, that's straightforward. But then instead of you having to call a bunch of generics, um, I don't know. Yeah. It feels straightforward, but I don't know. I'm, I'm confusing myself because I want this new class to be able to hold two different R6 objects like instantiate r6 objects inside of itself and then use those methods based on the type of r6 object that it's doing so it's like an r6 object that uses specific methods internally depending on what kind of r6 method is being called and i think i need to like make a diagram because it's hard to like keep track of while i'm doing it because it's like yeah i think you might be able to do that actually uh i haven't tried it but then when you define your r6 class i don't know just call it like a super class then inside you have an object of a different r6 class um so then you can say i don't know my object s1 dollar sign the internal object o1 and then dollar sign again and call one of the internal methods or um, fields of that internal object. Yeah. Because I wanted to do something like that, but then it was having a list of objects inside another R6. And I haven't tested, but I will let you know how it goes. Cool. It works. Yeah, yeah, that's that's more or less how I was thinking about doing it. I think I just like, I'm still processing the chapter and trying to like congeal it in a more methodical way because I've never like formally created our six classes and like programmed with it. And so like the kind of conceptual schema is unfamiliar and kind of nebulous still for me so i need to just like get a clear idea of, of how to do it because i want to make it simple for the users like this this service called apaca has two different streaming websocket services and so i want it to be like a single object the user is interacting with and then the r6 classes internally are for each of the different streaming services um 
that it uses from two different, you know, WebSocket locations. And then the methods are going to have to interact with those classes. I'm just wondering, I've never like used a R6 class as an input to an S3 method. Like I assume it's going to work um, because it's a class. And I assume that like the S3 method works by just like appending the class after a period. So like if I make an internal method to like the top level um, R6 class and I feed it one of the sub R6 classes, it should know what to do with that particular R6 class internally. But I haven't tested it at all, so we'll have to see if it actually does work the way I'm hoping. Yeah, I guess I wanted to do something similar because uh, then I had different requests, but then most of them take similar parameters. But then I wanted for the user to be like, they will say, oh, I want this particular request. So then I will call my object this request that I want. And then using the same arguments or parameters, they will get what they expect without knowing what's happening inside. And so I think that's that's a very good uh, test case, which I haven't done for I might try. Yeah. Oh. It seems like really useful for like instances like that where if you it's like if you have multiple data sources and they just like specify what data they want and then internally it's like setting up the database connection based on where that data is actually coming from and all that's kind of abstracted away and they're just getting at the data. That seems like where it could be like really useful as an internal thing for an organization. Yeah, definitely. Because um, then the users, they don't really care what's happening in the background. They care that if it's a database, they are able to connect to either MySQL or uh, SQLite, anything. They just say connect. They don't care how happen, how the connection happens. Yeah. Or if they do insert, exactly. they want to insert in, in that query should be formatted the right way. And so I work in a small package to do that and the users just pass like a table and then based on the table class, because then I give it a, the table in our class, then it knows how to parse that. But then they are just sending a table. They don't know how to insert that in the, the database. Yeah, interesting yeah. example. Yeah, I had I was doing something similar to that with a database, and I had the faulty assumption that like I was working with like thousands of rows of data, and I was like, it might be shorter if I like append this to the existing data with checks first, and like check to see if it needs to be appended, like if data already exists uh, that covers part of this time range, and then if not, append it. And I started working out trying to do that in SQL. Um, and then I, it was like really convoluted and difficult. And then I'm like, I wonder if this is actually any faster than just writing the whole freaking thing. Um, <laughs> like pull it, you know, have it, cause it's already in R and just like binding the rows together and then just writing the whole thing. And sure enough, when I like benchmarked it, the actual like, DBI connection to like append stuff into the SQL was slower than just binding the whole thing in R and writing the whole table over again. I don't know why, but it was. Of course, that wouldn't work if like the size of data was so large that, you know, it would overrun your RAM by trying to do it in R, but that wasn't the case here. Anybody have any 
wins this week? Mm. It's only Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, I guess, would be that. Um, just been like swamped in this like grant proposal for my supervisor it's not that fun mm. <laughs> that's where you just kind of have to lay out everything that you plan on doing right yeah, this is like this big, this like, let me see, there's 15 people on the grant and wow. so they're just like all trying to throw all their stuff in it and it's a mess. What is it on? What are y'all trying to research? It's for the um, NSF has these like big ideas and it's for it's called like harnessing the data revolution and this is like the phase two so they have to propose like a five-year institute on how data science can help science and engineering problems that are at a tipping point it's a bunch of just like fluff that they just make up is it like a specific problem that y'all are going to try to address or? Uh, no, I mean, we have like, we're combining two very different grants in this one, one, one on like catalytic, like microscope data, and then one just like on broad climate change impacts. Huh. So it's kind of all over the place. Well, it's good timing for that. I mean, I think there's probably going to be more funding for climate related stuff in the next four years. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. They're on like a tight, like I'm not a PI, but I have to help since I'm a postdoc. <laughs> mm -hmm. What you, what was your PhD in again? Statistics. Statistics. Okay. Well, thanks for tuning in, y'all. I hope y'all find some cool ways to use R6 in the future. Thank you for presenting. It was interesting. Yeah, yeah it was totally really good. Thanks. We'll see how it goes yeah. next week. S4. Oh, yay. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. It's the one he said, oh, it's always the one that he threw in at the end. It's like, oh, uh, you know, there's this other one that you probably should know about, but, you know, it's a bit crappy, so probably don't learn it properly. That's the impression I got from the uh, from the overarching, what's it, the summary at the beginning of the, the section. But, you know, we'll see. The, there seems to be a lot, an awful lot about emojis in it. Who's doing it? It's me. I can't say I've done um, a lot of object-oriented programming. This is all quite new to me. Um, I, you know, I kind of understand like object-oriented to some extent, but I don't tend to have to use a lot of it. It's more kind of um, it's just going on in the background and occasionally just going into it. But um, you know, learning all of this is all quite useful, but it all seems quite theoretical to some extent, especially the way it's written oh. about. Oh, no, you didn't. Yeah. S4 seems dense. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe that's part of the thing, is like, um, with the last one, it did seem, you know, when you talk about it before, it's with the last uh, chapter, it does seem quite... Um, kind of like going over a lot of the old material and the other one is a slightly different way of doing the same thing hmm. yeah yeah I don't know anything about S4 so I'm looking forward to learning some more about that 
I hope we can learn enough to actually pass it on. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. I know I've used this it is... in like spatial data and it's they it's weird. Like instead of the dollar sign, you use like an at symbol and then you have like different mm -hmm. spots. Yeah, same. That's the only place I've encountered it is in like spatial. I can't imagine having any, it probably, I'll probably have to stick to most of the examples that are in the book and, you know, maybe do some web searching to see who else has done the stuff. But it's like with R6, and I said it last week, it's, it seems a lot more intuitive than even um, S3 that we were using the week, we were looking at the week before. So, you know, it's quite nice, actually, in a way. But, you know, when you go over the why you use R6 bit at the back, he's got a list of things as to why to use R6. But he does say right at the beginning is, you should probably stick to S3 most of the time. Yeah. So, which <laughs> I kind of find confusing, but I think S3 is the one that I'd actually more often use. But when I see like what you've done there with the, um, with the, um, what's it called? Uh, the uh, data, the links linking in this phrase. The web sockets. Yeah, the web sockets. Yeah. That's really yeah. cool. That is really cool. It's a nice bit of code there. That's, well, the, I mean, the reason it made more sense was because WebSockets itself is built on R6. And I think that's kind of like, even if S3 might make more sense, because that's the way I originally kind of did it, it like make more sense for, from a novice point of view, which like, that's the only thing I could really do was S3, so that's the way I interacted with it. But now coming back to it, I'm like, this was made in R6. It doesn't make sense to try to like make it work with just S3. So like going back to it now and I'm like, how can I use R6 to extend this? Because that would make a lot more sense since it's already built in R6. And I feel like if something is underlying is built in R6, then it kind of makes sense to use it uh i mean i guess his, i see his point though like i know when i first saw something that used r6 kind of syntax it confused the heck out of me and i was like nope 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 and i just like put it away and didn't come back to it for a while um and i i feel that and it's easy to forget what it's like as a new user when you start to see like completely different syntax and you're like what the f I have no idea what's happening here. And I feel like that's probably why he says like, you know, think hard about using it before you use it. I think for me, it feels, um, it's, it's kind of a shame because it feels it's like, you know, you spend this time learning this kind of stuff and you think, well, for me right now, I don't really use it. Um, uh, because the systems that we use, when I use uh, R scripts, it's kind of like to, uh, proof of concept more often than not in terms of doing mostly statistics. And then that gets kind of like retranslated into Java or something like that. Um, but we are moving more towards, um, in my company, uh, more towards like uh, TensorFlow and we're looking at different libraries like Apache as well. So, um, might become more useful in the future. But at this moment in time, it's kind of like you don't, you go and practice it, you get all these quite contrived ideas, and then you're learning them, and it's like, it doesn't really stick in my brain. In yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You work at like an extension of the NHS, right? If... No, no, no. Um, I do um, demand forecasting. So um, most of my stuff is about um, kind of like, working out prices of products and uh, how that relates to sales and where and when to do them and you know what, uh. what what happens when they make different price decisions which is often a disaster at their end when we just provide the kind of like uh, the, the forecasting software at the other end sometimes you just see people make incredible decisions and you just think why did you do that <laughs> So this interesting. Well, how does it take inputs? Like, how would you make a decision on when to change a price, like a demand? 
Well, this is the thing. A lot of it is done currently in the background by um, by people manually um, because uh, it's partly defined by relationships between stores um, and also the suppliers. Like, for instance, Coca-Cola just are uh, kind of like one week on, one week off for sales constantly, which kind of defeats the whole point of sales. It, it, you know, it kind of creates an effect for, like, um, um, you know, if you... I suppose what they're kind of working on is a cognitive idea that, well, you, you know, people will load up at a certain point in time, they go off it, and then you just kind of switch that on and off. But the problem is it doesn't work very well in the long term. Um, I personally believe you're better off having, like, say, uh, kind of like low price continuous instead. It's a lot steadier. But the problem is it allows um, opposite opponents to come in. And so because branding's a really big thing, like, you know, at the end of the day, if, we were really bothered about uh, flavor. We wouldn't be buying Coca Cola because it's actually not that great, um, not compared to like other brands, for instance. Um, but people are very much brand um, connected. Um, but the goal at the moment is uh, a lot of what we do is just about shaving off uh, a percent, you know, half percentage point off uh, the error term or making it slightly better. So it's about creating better and better models. Uh, with time series data and well with any luck but the other things we're looking at do the other things that we're working on are things like markov chains and trying to tie together um you know if what something's on sale what's the most likely thing that people want to buy with that or you know oh. so and then the goal eventually you know as you build up the system you make it more and more complex would be adding in well what sales do you want what do you want on sale when do you want it on sale as well as opposed to just allowing human error really to judge a lot of this stuff, which is one of the biggest problems because um, a lot of people at the other end is, you know, quite bright, but, you know, humans aren't as good at making decision-making in some instances when it comes to choosing when, when to put things on promotions and when not to, but, you know, yeah. it's kind of like, um, it's probably trying to find a medium between, working out what the computer is better at and what the humans are better at or uh, reducing the options down to make it easier for the analysts at the other side. Hmm. That's cool. What do you think is going to happen with uh, demand for airlines and travel companies in the next oh, that's seven gonna, months? That's going to be insane. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you uh, if you if you're into stock markets, I'd definitely buy into travel company right now. It's, uh, it's going to be very valuable. I was so. thinking about that yesterday. I was like, you know what? I should probably get some stock in some airlines and Travelocity and stuff because it's probably going to go through the roof in like eight months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a company in the U um, in Europe called Tui. I'm not sure if you have them over there. They're uh, they're they're They've been hit really, really, really hard. But a lot of their buildings have been sat empty and they've got grants from governments and all that kind of thing. The problem is, uh, whilst people's savings are on average something like, people have about 29% savings or something like that. I don't quite know how they work that out compared to standard of something like 6 to 9%. Um, uh, I, I think that might be the UK, really. Um, but that means that people have lost money sat in their bank accounts, not doing an awful lot because, they're, you know, it's quite a risky economy right now. But a lot of people are going to want to go uh, traveling. So that would be quite a nice thing to do. But the problem is we're also seeing um, unemployment shoot up as well. And once the brakes are off and, um, you know, we can see the full damage that's been done from all these lockdowns it might not be as simple like i think that traveling might work but i'm not sure if there's going to be if it's a simple case of um the then people, the brakes come off and then everyone goes traveling because a load of people will but i think at the same time you've got to be very worried about a lot of um a lot of jobs that might just disappear yeah we'll see yeah. i mean yeah. we've got brexit in the uk so yay <laughs> Roberta knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I definitely think there's probably going to be a massive amount of jobs that they that were eliminated that aren't ever going to come back. It was just like that was the excuse to get rid of all those jobs that like 
had been automated, but they didn't really want to lay off the person who's like near retirement. Mm -hmm. But now it's just like that job is gone forever now. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's also like things like offices. And I think the whole world's changed how it's going to work. You know, if you were like, um, you know, an office worker, I, I, I don't see much room for people, you know, because we're data scientists or data engineers. We, you know, I don't see much scope for us needing to be in the office how often. We have, you know, people like us have great conversations online. Uh, a lot of what we do when we're talking is, you know, one of us talks for a little while and then we stop and then wait for other people to respond. Whereas it's not so much debate. It's kind of like um, information exchange. And I just feel like, our kind of jobs don't necessarily require being in the office so much. So office spaces are kind of getting reduced right down. And that's just our line. You know, it's going to be the same for IT specialists, for everyone else. It'd be, it's a really interesting time in a way, but kind of terrifying at the same time. A lot is restructuring. My, that's for sure. Um, aunt works at Allstate here in like Chicago. And she said they're turning the whole like campus into like hoteling offices only and you won't work every day in the office and you won't have like a permanent desk like the whole company (laughs) yeah that's yeah i I bet that's happening in a lot of places it's the um, yeah sorry yeah i feel like it's going to move towards the kind of like yeah, like hotels paired with temporary office spaces, like co-work spaces, instead of having just like the big block, everybody's got a nameplate office kind of thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, my, um, my sister says that uh, her company changed to Flexi Office. Um, so I think that's probably, uh, you know, like like, uh, like you just mentioned, the... Um, you know, there's no need for you know hot desking thing of the future, really, isn't it? Come in, have a have a meeting, meet people you work with, and then go home. You're like this whole kind of you know, you think about this whole kind of torturous system that we've had going on for quite a while, where people all move to to like drive to the center of the city just to sit next to a computer. It's like yeah, why? why? <laughs> you know. Like, it's like, so ridiculous, like the butts in seats mentality. Well, if you think about, um, there's a, this nice bit of um, analysis, I can't remember where it is, but it basically shows that as people have had more free time, technology and, like, kind of knowledge creation has just flown out, like, spiraled to such an extent where we're creating more knowledge than ever before. We're uh, learning more faster and creating new technology. And that's occurred because we've got more free time. And yet we've been giving up like an hour to two hours of our time traveling every single day to work and back. And it's like, it's insane. You can spend that time on like health and fitness instead. And then that you're getting that little bit extra time back that you could then spend on, you know, self-improvement or, you know, or like, for instance, getting your job done better, reducing stress. You know, I think it's so much better working from home. Yeah. Are, but, you know, we're in a lucky position, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that this kind of work can be done remotely for sure. Yeah, it just, it makes so much sense for everything that can be done remotely to be done remotely for exactly that reason. There's just, there's no point in, in commute. Like I can see a point in like coming together like once a week or month or something to be like in person and there being like intentional time for employees to like congregate and converse with each other because the kind of like social knitting is really important for collaboration. But most of the time that doesn't happen. There's like, most people aren't doing that on most of the days of the week. So like, you don't really need to make that commute. And every single day, it's really just, it's a, hopefully a thing of the past for the most part. Yeah. I, I got to so. get going though. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, no worries. Yeah, great, I, great talk to you guys. As usual. Likewise, definitely. See you all next week. Looking forward to S4.